So one Sabbath day, Jesus enters a synagogue in Nazareth, and he begins to teach. First of all, imagine walking into church and seeing that Jesus is your guest speaker, right? But Jesus, he begins this sermon by rolling out the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he begins to read from it. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So Jesus finishes reading. He rolls up the scroll, he hands it to the attendant, and he sits down. All the eyes in the synagogue are locked on him. Everyone is waiting on the edge of their seat for what Jesus is going to say next. Then he drops it. His bottom line, his big idea, the sticky statement to end all sticky statements. Jesus says today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And the crowd loses it. They love it. They begin to praise Jesus' words and marvel at how this hometown kid just gave the best eight-word sermon that they've ever heard. Plus, church has been so short, they're going to make their brunch plans. What a great day in the synagogue. But then something happens. Jesus keeps talking. He quotes a proverb alludes to a few other Old Testament passages, and before he can call the band to the stage for closing prayer, the crowd has become furious with him. So furious that they actually drive him out of the temple. They drive him out of the town and try to throw him off a cliff. I have become obsessed with this story from Luke chapter 4, over the last couple weeks, because it brings up the question that I'm sure many of you are asking. How does this happen? How does Jesus lose the crowd so quickly? What could he possibly have said to cause the same people who were praising him in verse 22 to want to throw him off a cliff by verse 29? Well, in order for us to understand that, we first have to understand why they were so excited in the first place. You see, up until this point in history, since the time of the prophet Isaiah, God's chosen people had been waiting to be liberated from their oppressors. Whether it was Babylon or Assyria or the current oppression from the Roman Empire, the Jewish people were waiting for God's goodness and his love and his salvation to come to them. That is the deep cultural and religious desire that Jesus is cluing into by reading from the scroll of Isaiah. But then Jesus hits that bottom line, that sticky statement to end all sticky statements. He says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Essentially, what Jesus is claiming is that that moment of liberation and freedom and salvation that the Jews have been longing for for centuries, that moment has arrived. It's here, now, in him. And so, of course, the people lose their minds. They've been longing for this. But again, Jesus doesn't stop there. But over the course of the next five verses... Jesus refers to two Old Testament stories in which God uses very well-known, reputable prophets to serve and bring good news not just to their fellow Israelites, but to Gentiles, to non-Jews as well. And by doing this, Jesus is alluding that this ministry to the Gentiles is part of his mission as well. And this is too much. This is too radical for the members of the Nazareth synagogue. You see, the Jewish people could accept that God's love and liberation and salvation would come to them. After all, they were the children of Abraham. They were God's chosen people. But to suggest that the love that God had for the Jews was equal 
to the love that God had for the Gentiles. That the goodness that God wanted to bring to those within the synagogue was the same as the goodness God wanted to give to those on the outside. That the freedom that God wants to bring to us is the same as the freedom that God wants to bring to them. Well, now, Jesus, you've just gone too far. There is a stark contrast in this story between the way the people in the synagogue view the work of God and the way Jesus views the work of God. The people of the synagogue are first and foremost concerned with their own self-preservation. It becomes very clear throughout the story that they really only care about their own liberation, their own freedom, their own good, and anything that even remotely feels like a threat to or distraction from that is immediately driven out. The people of the synagogue are first and foremost concerned about the preservation of self. But what we see from Jesus time and time again is that he is all about the liberation of the other. For Jesus, the kingdom of God, it may have started with the Jews, but it certainly wasn't going to stop with the Jews. For Jesus, the liberating power of God was not contained by racial or religious or societal or economic lines. For Jesus, you can't limit who God wants to liberate. And so imagine for me that you are a Christian living in the year 2020, and you see your church post something online with the words, Black Lives Matter. And at first, there's some confusion that pops up in you. Maybe you're not sure what to think or how to feel. There may even be some hesitation. Why are we getting political in church? You might have some reservations. Do we even know what the organization of Black Lives Matter stands for? Have you gone to their website? And if we're really honest, there probably is a little bit of personal resistance. I'm not racist. Why does it feel like everyone online is telling me that I am? Why are we even talking about this in church? Aren't we going a little too far? And I want you to hear me. I am not saying that you are wrong or you are a bad person if you have questions or confusion or hesitation right now. I myself have had so many questions, tons of hesitation that has popped up in me over the last couple weeks. But I also believe that the challenge that we, specifically as white Christians, are being given right now is to hold ourselves accountable to when these questions or hesitations are coming from a place of self-preservation. Like, is my hesitation to this really because I feel that my reputation as a good person is being threatened by what I'm seeing? Do my reservations truly come from a place of godly wisdom, or underneath it, is there actually some personal pride at work? Does my resistance to this actually come from a fear that true equality will mean less for me, or that there's not enough for me? Am I knowingly or unknowingly putting the work of God in a box in order so that I can remain comfortable? Matthew Henry says the doctrine of God's sovereignty or his right to do his will provokes proud men. And in so many ways, I think that is exactly what we are seeing in our culture right now. Because in so many ways, that's exactly what I'm beginning to recognize in my own heart. But the truth is, you just can't limit who God wants to liberate. Just because Jesus loves you doesn't mean he only loves you. Just because God's grace has come to you doesn't mean it stops with you. Just because God has set you free doesn't mean there still aren't other people that God wants to liberate. And who knows, he may even want to use you as part of that process. You cannot limit who God wants to liberate. And here's the best part. You don't have to because there is no limitation to God's liberation. This is mean girls, people. The limit does not exist. 
And to believe in a just God is to believe that there's actually enough of him to go around. That there's enough of God's love and goodness and provision and freedom and justice for all of us. There's no limitation to God's liberation. In fact, I actually believe that God wants to liberate us from our limits. God wants to liberate us from this limiting belief that there's only enough of God's goodness for the people of my neighborhood or the people in my church or people of my race or my gender or my political party or my theology or my denomination. No, there's enough of God for all of us. And so rather than continually clinging and obsessing over my reputation or my status, or my chosenness, or however else I lean into self-preservation. May we instead take the posture of Jesus, who continually denied himself and laid down his life for the liberation of others. Just as I have received God's love and liberation in abundance, I will share his love and liberation in abundance. Hey friends, thanks so much for watching this sermon. I know that in this teaching we touched on uh, some things going on in our culture and some words and some language that has proved to be pretty controversial, um, especially amongst Christians. And so what I want to ask of all of you is before you jump into the comments, before you give any opinions, before you even ask any questions, that each and every one of us would first do the work that I'm prescribing here. To rather than giving in to our resistance or our hesitation right away, to simply ask, where is that coming from? Is it coming from a place of godly wisdom, or is there some of my own pride? Am I coming at this from a place of self-preservation? When I was writing this message, I went through that process for a while. For several days, I sat in prayer with God over the words of this message. So I ask, before you respond to it, that you would humbly do the same because then I think we can engage in perhaps a little bit more of a civil discourse over all of this. Um, I, I just think there's goodness and there's growth that God has for each and every one of us during this time, regardless of where we might be. And so I just, I I hope I've earned enough of a platform uh, in your life at this point, after many years of creating videos, that you would know my heart, that it is first and foremost to lead people forward in faith and closer to Jesus. And I hope this video and this teaching has done that for you. That's all I have. I love you all. Keep being awesome.